this is a good time to get going just in case there's questions at the end or anything like that. As you can see, this is gaming gurus building games for the real world, and that's what I do. My name is Steve Sloda. I'm an adjunct professor here. I'm a graduate student in educational psychology, and I've been a gamer for a very long time. So I go about playing games and then seeing what kinds of things can we use to make education better, make business better, and hopefully not have our projector blow up as it's ticking right next to me. That's that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of background. I was a teacher. Prior to that, I was a genetic engineer, and now I study games. And so I kind of went on this really bizarre path from where I started to where I ended up. Thankfully, it happened that way because I'm not sure I would be happy still being in a lab. And it's more fun to play games at work than it is to do things like sit under a fume hood. So if any of you are MCB or orgo or chemistry or anything like that, I think you can appreciate that. So to kind of get started, this whole presentation was kind of going to be about what I do as a researcher and what game designers do and sort of how those two things can blend between academia and game design. I want you to imagine for a second that you're a third grade teacher. And so you go into your first day of school, it's August 28th or whatever the day happens to be, and you put this up on the board for your third grade students and what do you think is going to happen? You tell them there's going to be a quiz at the end of the week. And what's going to happen? Panic. Panic, right? Panic. They're probably going to fail. Not fail. Not care and not do it. That's also a possibility. I think they fail. <laughs> or just have no idea what's going on. In my experience with third graders, they're probably going to cry. They're going to go home and tell their parents, and you, you might lose your job. <laughs> sure. That seems like a very probable thing. And there's a lot of information there, right, and to ask a nine-year-old to be able to know. Now, think about that as I transition to this slide, and I ask you, how many Pokemon are there now? Something. something like 650, yeah. 750, yeah. something along those lines, right? And all of them sort of have this yeah. table where they're good against some things or not good against others. And probably more than 70% of your third graders know all that information. So we ask them to learn the periodic table of the elements and chaos ensues, but we ask them to learn this and, and they have no problem doing so. And the funny thing is, there's four times more information here than there is in the periodic table of the elements. So one of the things we're really interested in is this idea of why do kids care so much more about things like Pokemon than they do about the periodic table? And could you make the periodic table more like Pokemon? What's Pokemon's catchphrase? Got to catch them all. all. We don't have kids walking into a chemistry classroom and feeling like, yeah, I can't believe I finally caught... Mercury. Mercury. <laughs> Sure. Hopefully they don't get it on their skin There's or. Another way to lose your job. <laughs> yeah, that's another good way to lose your job. So, we really want to know what makes games special and school not so special, and how do we get kids to sort of adopt this goal or intention to care about the kinds of things we want them to care about, as opposed to just the things that are kind of fun. I want to talk to you a little bit about the history of where storytelling and narrative comes from because that's a really important piece of this. Games are just a form of storytelling. And it's not just games that are social. All games, or games that we typically consider social, things that are, say, Call of Duty you might play online or any game with a headset or anything where you might have somebody saying awful things about your mother while you're playing it, those are social in their own way. But even games like Solitaire can be social where somebody has to teach you how to play solitaire. And you can talk about this one time you had this awesome game of solitaire and you couldn't believe you won, but magically you did. And that's still a social experience. That's a storytelling opportunity. That's rooted in history, human history. And back a long time ago when I was more of a biologist still, I was very fascinated with this idea. It shouldn't come as a surprise that evolutionary history and the history of gameplay and storytelling are deeply related. Those three things really are deeply related. So even 40,000 years ago, we have evidence that people told stories to one another. One of the things that you can probably relate to is this idea that we store information in other people. So we can't, as individuals, remember a lot of things. And this is where the psychology comes into play. But we can't remember a lot of things. So we have other people remember them for us. So when you go out with your friends and you're having dinner and you're talking about that movie you saw, and you go, hey, you know, you know the guy who always wears a shirt, that guy? And they're like, oh, yeah, you meant Benedict Cumberbatch. And that's an instance in which we store information in other people. 
And then we use this particular structure that stories come in, which is beginning, middle, and end, to frame all that information so we can retain it for a longer period of time or be able to use it for a longer period of time. So we have evidence that that's been going on for a very long time. And every culture in the world uses stories to convey information about life, about the afterlife, about what goes on in a day-to-day -day scenario, what they've experienced personally in the past, or what their family has experienced in the past. If we fast forward a little bit, we see the same thing in Japanese culture, with Japanese story art, with Native American story art. And this is even before there's written language, right? This is many, many thousands of years before there's written language. Finally, we get closer to written language with hieroglyphics, and now we can actually start to understand what those stories were trying to say. And then eventually we get to Greek vase painting and at the actual written word in ancient Greek. Now, around the same time that ancient Greek started to form, and we get our bards, like Homer, what ends up happening is we get information about what education really is. Now, up to this point, storytelling has been the only form of education anyone had. So people would come into a room or a big group and then just talk about stuff. They'd tell stories about the past. And all of our major works of, I guess you could call them history up to this point, including the Bible, including the Iliad and the Odyssey, including Herodotus and Thucydides, all of these accounts of what happened a long time ago were built on this oral storytelling tradition. And eventually we end up at a point where we have Plato talking about the relevance of this to education. So when Plato sat down and wrote The Cave, how many of you are familiar with this, the allegory of the cave? Okay, for those of you who are kind of on the fence about it, the allegory of the cave is this story in which Plato, the famous philosopher, tells a story about Socrates, or an avatar of Socrates, being chained to the bottom of a cave. And next to him are all these other men and women who are also chained to the bottom of the cave. And all they can see on the wall are these shadows. Now the shadows take the forms of things that they might recognize, like a chair or a cat or a dog or another person. And that's all they know about the entire world, is just these shadows, these puppets. And so Socrates eventually realizes that his chains aren't tied to anything. And he goes, well, why am I sitting here? I'm going to get up and go look around. And so he stands up and starts walking out of the cave. And that's when he finds out that the shadows are really just basically cardboard cutouts being passed in front of a fire. And they really don't exist. And so when he eventually moves up further and gets out of the cave, he's blinded by the light. And you could make a nice couch potato joke here about gamers not wanting to get up and go outside. So he comes back down to the bottom, tells everyone how awesome it is to go outside and play outside, and then they turn around and kill him. Because so he interrupted their game of Call of Duty or whatever they were doing, and he gets in the way. So the reason why we refer to this as the first video game is because in a way, well, two reasons. One, there's a sort of a primitive form of duck hunt going on here where the people chained to the bottom or perceived to have been chained to the bottom of the cave actually guess which shadow is going to uh, come next and they have awards or badges or points to kind of decide who's the winner and you would get honors bestowed upon you for guessing correctly so that's kind of like the duck hunt piece but also because much in the same way that games work in our lives they tell a fictitious story that's supposed to emulate things about the real world and that's exactly what was going on here Plato saw that all of these puppets that were going on in the real world, and in this case, education, telling false stories about Homer, uh, Homer's characters, all of that education was just teaching people false things about the world, that it wasn't something that they really needed to know, and that it was teaching them to be bad learners, because it was teaching them things that were truly false, if that makes any sense. So eventually he writes a story to basically create an irony in which he shows that storytelling is bad, but he's using story to explain why stories are bad. So when you go back and look at this through a modern lens, it makes a lot more sense in terms of what we want to be doing as teachers, helping students understand where they can break their own caves, where they can come to understand what things matter in life and what things don't really matter, and where do they see the similarities and differences between stories and the real world. And that's where this comes in. We see things like the bardic tales, and they're also replayed again and again and again, no pun intended, with things like Knights of the Old Republic, or Dragon Age, or Skyrim, or any of these other stories in which there's good versus evil, or there's some other sort of overarching theme going on.
And that's exactly what the bards used to do. They would teach people lessons about life by going and telling them a story. And that's what we do as players. We go and tell a story of our learning, about what we've learned morally or ethically or just content-wise about what we're actually participating in. Now, there's a couple of re reasons why you would want to go and study something like this. First, because video games are now ubiquitous. Roughly 50% of players are male, 50% are female. 92 to 93% of individuals play games by the time they're 18 years old. So many, many, many people are playing games by the time they're 18 years old, and many are carrying on. The average age for a gamer now is roughly about 35, 36 years old. And these are people who grew up with the original Atari, or original Nintendo, and have moved on. And now there's a younger generation also coming in, so the mean age is moving up. The second thing is, currently the evidence linking gameplay to academic achievement, and this is re specifically referring to educational gaming, is very slim. We don't know a lot about why people learn, or in this case, what things are valuable about games that makes them worth pursuing an education. We think there's something there. We know there's something there. People have been using stories and games for a long time. I mean, I'm sure you've all used an Easy Bake Oven at some point. You're pretending to be an adult, doing a, an adult thing to learn that behavior. Now, it's much safer to create something in an Easy Bake Oven because you really can't burn the house down with an Easy Bake Oven, or unlike a gas it. stove. But it's a way to experience these authentic adult activities in as close a way as you can, to simulate them. The same thing is true of playing War or playing House. If you've ever played a game like Call of Duty or you've ever played The Sims, those are just effectively ways that you can go and mimic adult behaviors and learn what it is to be an adult. Now, I would argue that life after college is a little bit different than The Sims. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as just wiping the floor and your whole house is clean and you don't just sit there for five minutes and have a baby. And you don't just not, finding a job is not as easy as going on the computer, clicking yes, and having a job. Just I mean, there's. Giving up on the way to the bathroom. Exactly, or giving up on the way to the bathroom. <laughs> Yet we can still get information from games like The Sims that allow us to mimic adult behavior in a way that's valuable to us. We wrote a paper, my colleagues and I, about two years ago, and one of the things we said is that people researching this kind of thing are currently looking in the wrong castle. So if you've ever played Mario, you know the famous phrase, your princess is in another castle, that's what we named the paper. Because the entire premise of that paper was that there's all these cool things games can do, and yet researchers continue boiling them down to one or two or three generalizations about what makes games work and what makes them not work. Games are good, or games are bad, or this kind of game is good and this kind of game is bad. And we think that's way too general. That we're picking out these variables that don't necessarily make any sense, and then making them generalize so they apply to everyone. And our suggestion was that the community move in two directions. One, to begin partnering with successful gaming companies to actually see what makes their games successful, which currently is not being done. There's no relationship being formed there. And the second, that researchers need to start looking at the way individual players play individual games under individual circumstances with individual experiences, which I realize is a mouthful. But the experiences we bring to gameplay are incredibly important. They change and shape our intentions and our goals, the way we pursue certain things. And while I might play Grand Theft Auto one way, you might play it in a completely different way. And there's the same story arc that the designers have given us, but the way we go about fulfilling it is entirely different from person to person. And the choices we make are entirely different. Now, our joke is that everyone's Trevor. If you've ever played GTA V, Trevor is kind of the psychotic lunatic. And that ultimately, at heart, everyone's a psychotic lunatic. But some people might choose not to play Grand Theft Auto that way. They might choose to play it as a very ethical person, that they don't want to run people over, that they will actually follow the traffic laws. That could be the goal they've created for themselves for one reason or another. We don't know why. <laughs> Similarly, when I used to play World of Warcraft, I would create goals for myself all the time that had nothing to do with the game. There was one specific area of the map where the... A, uh, the range from the top of the sky to the bottom of the ground was just long enough to play the 1812 overture while you were falling to your death. <laughs> and it was brilliant. That was my goal, was to find a place where I could do that because it would be so funny if I hit the ground white when the music ended. It would make this really sort of epic ending, right? Another good example is one of my friends and I who happens to be here. He and I, when we used to play Halo, created a catapult where we used one warthog jeep 
to run into another warthog jeep and use that to fly off a cliff and land on an NPC soldier that was standing on the ground. And that's a goal that's completely unrelated to the game. The game gives us the affordances of the environment that's been designed to do those things. But we're the ones who bring the experiences in and decide that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a catapult that's going to land on that guy and it's going to be funny. And that's just the way... Yeah, it was. <laughs> and that's just the way that it works out. And researchers right now are not looking at those things. They're saying, here's what the game designer intended, or here's what we design as the researchers who are designing games, and here's what our students are doing to reach that goal. We think we need to go the other direction and say, when given a game, what are people who are playing it actually doing with it? And what can we find out about the way they're interacting with that environment to make something that they're going to be more motivated to do? So get different games can serve different purposes here. There's a lot of different ways we can use the same kinds of games, but many are driven by these sort of underlying themes. For instance, World of Warcraft is an MMO. You work with many people to solve these big problems, which come in the form of sort of raid bosses or other things that can require 40 friends to go help you. There are things like L.A. Noir that require logic or problem solving. There are games like Portal, which also require logic and problem solving, albeit of a different kind. This is more of physical manipulation rather than just problem solving with clues. You have things like Tetris that involve spatial manipulation, changing shapes, moving them around, fitting them together. You have things like Quest Atlantis, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. That's a specifically educational game that was designed for middle school students to help them learn how to use language arts material and use science material to become better students. We also have things like this, the original Oregon Trail. The greatest game ever made. Yes. <laughs> Everyone knows the phrase, you have died of dysentery. <laughs> or, you forded the river and all your oxen have died. Yeah, I mean, a snake bite. <laughs> yeah, so-and-so has a snake bite, so-and-so has died of typhoid. <laughs> the original Oregon Trail had many purposes, but the primary one was to be educational. Somebody wanted to teach kids about the Oregon Trail. We don't always succeed. And that's exactly where I'm going with this. There are other things like Street Pass, the 3DS. I have my 3DS here, and you get this little green light when you pass somebody else who has a Street Pass activated. And the purpose of that is really interesting, too. Nintendo has taken this approach where they have their sort of in-game currency. But unlike companies like EA, where you have to pay money in order to get that currency, or a better example might be Zynga or King, which require you to pay real money to get this sort of currency, Nintendo's only payment is exercise. Get up and move around, and we're going to give you the benefit of doing that. We're going to reward you with not only this currency, but also the other added currency of you're passing other people, we're going to share your information back and forth, and you'll get benefits to playing the game if you pass other people who also have a 3DS. So there's a lot of cool things going on there. And then finally, perhaps the most important game is school. Now you might wonder about that for a second. Why would I call school a game? Well, there are points, there are scores, there are awards, there are winners and losers, and where your princess is is unknown at this point. You still have to figure that out on your own. But school is a big game. It's designed by someone else. They have goals in mind for you when you go to school. You come in with your own experiences and decide what your goals are going to be. So school really is just one big game. It's a big MMO. We have all work together to solve problems, or we don't, and sometimes we can't solve those problems. It is a very expensive game. We're at a university right now that is roughly, last I checked, $40,000 $40, a year if you're out of state and don't have any scholarships, something like that. Very expensive. In-state, it's something like yeah, 22 in-state now. So school is a very expensive game. Now, that's another interesting point. Games are so compelling that people are willing to pay to play them. Now, when I go back to the Pokemon example, I couldn't pay my students to come to class to learn about the periodic table. But I could get them to pay 60 70 $300 to play Pokemon every time a new console comes out with a new game. And they're paying for the privilege to learn more about Pokemon. Now, that's an incredibly powerful tool that schools still haven't capitalized on and businesses still haven't capitalized on. So there's a lot of information around us to perceive and we need to figure out how do we get people to perceive the right things in the situations we want them to. In this example, I've used League of Legends. 
League of Legends has a lot of stuff going on all the time. It's a very busy user interface. So I can see my character right here. That's my character. And there's all this other information on the screen. So we have a chat window over here. We have some buttons down there that must do something. We have a sentence coming up here in the center of the screen. That's got to be something that must be important if it's in the middle. We also have this information down here. That's a little portrait and some numbers. I don't know what those do. Uh, we have this up in the corner. That shows some more numbers. I don't know what those numbers do. Oh my god, there's this thing in the corner. What does that do? That must be a map of some kind. But above it is this thing that has this little sword icon. And that's green. Is green good or is green bad? And then over here we have five people or four people in addition to myself would be five that are talking about things we also have some red guy over there or something that's marked as red red's usually bad and then all this stuff going on in the middle so there's a lot of information around us all the time when we're playing games like league of legends now solitaire is a little bit more straightforward there's not as many things to perceive although that's not to say there's no strategy involved but with something like this, with a video game like League of Legends, there's so much going on, we need to be able to learn how to play the game in order to become effective at it. And over time, you go from being a novice to an expert. Now, some of that is learned socially through other people, through websites or the so-called metagame, Fora. If you played World of Warcraft or other MMOs, there's MMO Champion, there's ThoughtBot, there's WoWhead. And yet there are other things, too, like strategy guides. GameStop, I believe, still stocks strategy guides. Those are there. Often, gaming companies will have their own fora or their own descriptions of how to play games. There are reviews of games online. There's people who share information or playthroughs on YouTube. Twitch TV exists now. You can watch somebody else play in real time. You can even donate money to them if you think they're doing a really good job. So there's all these opportunities for interaction. And that's even just outside the game. This is the game itself, and then there's all this other stuff going on outside of it. Now, when we put that into practice, this is what we see is something really complex. This is World of Warcraft, not League of Legends, but there's so much information here to take apart. And what are we going to do with that information? How do we know what information is relevant and what information isn't relevant? There's just so much to take in. One of my goals as a researcher is to then talk about the situativity of gameplay. That is, how am I interacting with the environment, having a dialogue with the environment to take action every time I perceive something different? And how do I know what's important and what's not? And how do those important or not important things affect my goals and intentions? In this particular case, I see there's all these numbers going on in the screen. Now, if I try to take care of all this stuff at once, I would hit this point of overload where I simply wouldn't be able to understand what was going on. So I go through and I nitpick the things that I know are a high priority and then go down the list. So because I used to play World of Warcraft, I know that this is very important. That green bar means I'm alive as opposed to dead. I know that the information, what's going on on the screen is very important in the middle in terms of what this big thing is because that's what I'm trying to fight. And then you go down the list and you check over and over and over again. In many ways, it's a lot like driving a car. You know what information is most important, and then there's all the other information. So you know that the information directly in front of you through the windshield is the most important thing, because if a deer jumps out in front of you, you've got to deal with that real quick. And then you know there's all this sort of peripheral information, your side mirrors, your rear view mirror. And then you have other information. You might have something like your gas gauge or the RPMs of your engine. And then finally, you have things like the knobs for your CDs. All of those things take precedence in a certain order. Now, the big question for us is how do we use games in the real world? And that's really why I wanted to kind of do this little presentation, is to talk about what do we do with this stuff? How do we take Plato's cave, this idea that storytelling can be useful to draw comparisons between the real world and the fake world, to make people understand what things matter and what things don't? How do we take that and turn it into something that people will play? like Skyrim, like Bioshock, like Halo. Before I get into that, I want to make one really important distinction. Gamification is a word you may have heard of. It's becoming increasingly prevalent, especially for companies. Schools are trying to do it now. A lot of people are trying to do it. Gamification specifically talks about taking badges or points or awards and giving them to people in return for doing something you wanted them to do. It's behavioral reinforcement. It's the same thing as your dog does what you want it to do, so you give it a treat. The alternative to that is what we call game-based learning or educational gaming. 
which is taking something that has a rich story, a rich narrative, a rich background, and gives an authentic experience. So it's not just taking something that's distasteful and putting sort of this sugary coating on top of it and saying, oh, look, it's a game now. It's actually changing the way we look at learning, at the way we engage people to say, okay, here's what we want you to do. We're going to take and turn that into a story about how you're going to do it. Class Dojo, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. Class Dojo is kind of an interesting tool, but it is very gamification-y, where essentially what you do is you give awards to students, and this is especially tailored for little kids. They have little monster avatars that they have, and then you assign them these awards, and when they get the awards, it shows a percentage of behavioral management chart at the end of the week that you can send to parents. And the kids get happy because they see the little monster dance, or they, they see that they get the little badge show up next to their name, and everybody sees what, how good they were, and that reinforces the good behaviors you want them to have. Alternatively, if you had a text-based role-playing game in Husky CT or Blackboard, ultimately what you'd be doing is framing your course as a game. And instead of just giving people points or badges whenever they do something you want them to do, you'd actually be engaging them with the material in a novel way, in a way that's more enriching or authentic. So both can be useful, but gamification is incredibly limited. And it's been around for a long time. We've known it for many, many years. B.F. Skinner was actually one of the most famous people to deal with this. The guy who did experiments with rats and food pellets. And they would push the lever and the food pellet would come out. And that's how they learned to push the lever. This goes on in schools a lot. We use something called PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention Support Systems. And what those do is essentially give students reinforcers for everything they do good. We use the same thing in gamification. Game-based learning or educational gaming is moving a step beyond that and saying, let's apply other learning theories to make this work better for us. So the first answer to that big question of how do we do this is to build philosophizing games. Philosophizing games are the ones that are going to make people make moral decisions. For instance, with Mass Effect, you make choices that theoretically were supposed to matter at the end of the series. <laughs> the goal ended up being that you wanted to look at people's behavior and you want them to be able to explore reality. And so their goal is to be someone different. GTA is kind of the same thing. You can make those decisions. Fable is kind of the same thing. You can make those decisions and they should have an impact on the way that the game plays out, at least to some extent. In GTA 5, you can take people, pick them up on the side of the road and choose to bring them where they want to go or bring them to a cult of cannibals and leave them there to die. Those are moral decisions you can make. Philosophizing games helps people understand the ramifications of making certain kinds of decisions and allows them to experiment with things they couldn't do in real life. Additionally, we get them thinking about what kinds of values do I have? What kinds of ethics do I have? What kinds of morals do I have? What kinds of things do I care about or not care about? Second answer is build cave-breaking games. Games that make people see where the real world fails sometimes where we are limited as human beings to be able to solve certain kinds of problems or to be able to see invariant elements of different environments. For instance, with Bioshock, I, I'll try not to spoil anything, but with Bioshock, there's this critical moment through the first game where suddenly you realize that the world is not what you thought it was and that your decisions up to that point really didn't matter as much as you thought they did. That's a cave-breaking moment right there. That's exactly what Plato is driving at, this idea that we're in control only insofar as we think we're in control. There's a great line from Game of Thrones about that, too, that power resides in the people we believe power resides in. It's very similar, this idea that the real world is limited by our perceptions and actions within it. So if we can create games in which people come to recognize those things, it'll help them be better critical thinkers in the long run. And finally, building role-playing games that are going to help people be able to take on experiences they couldn't otherwise have. Now, this game right here is actually multiple games being shown here are games that I've designed with my colleagues. One of them is about ancient, Greek, uh, ancient Rome and Latin. One of them is about biology. I've also done some with educational psychology and educational technology. And ultimately, what we want to do is create authentic experiences for people who don't get to experience things. And it could be for a variety of reasons, partly because maybe it's too difficult, maybe it's too dangerous, maybe because you just simply can't do it. We can't go back to ancient Rome. We don't have time travel yet. 
So we want to create these experiences where people can simulate behaviors just like you do with your Easy Bake Oven, just like you do when you play house. Now there's two different ways to do this. One is sort of a quantitative approach where you take number data and you go and kind of crunch that and start thinking about what can I do with this number data. Now when you play a game like SimCity, for instance, what happens is every time you push a button or click the mouse, that mouse click is recorded in a giant database. So beware, the NSA knows what you're clicking on in SimCity. Be careful how many phallic-shaped cities you make because you don't know who's watching. When you play SimCity, you can do all kinds of things. You can choose what goes where, what order you do things in, and you can actually detect the differences between new players and experienced players based on the mouse clicks that they take. You could do the same thing with World of Warcraft with people who are doing PvP together. Those mouse clicks will all be recorded. The order will always be recorded. Now, once you have that information, it looks kind of like this. This is a log file. And it goes on and on and on. There are many, 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 many lines of code for this. Essentially, what researchers can do is they can organize that information in a way that makes it useful to us. And you end up with something that looks like this, which is a graph of that data. Not of this data, but of log file data. And essentially, these nodes that pop out on the edges are what you can localize as being very important. And you can look at specific tracks people take to find commonalities between people who are experienced or not experienced. You can also find novel experiences people have, for instance, with the people who make the catapult with the warthogs and Halo. You can go and find that information here and see how does it relate to other things? How do new players choose to play the game? And then you can go and correlate that with what goals did those people have and why did they choose to do it that way? The alternative to that is more qualitative and can be really helpful for informing that first approach. Qualitative research is when you take and do inductive reasoning, typically, to be able to make sense of what people say or do. Now, unlike quantitative, which is statistically significant, you can actually make claims about correlations and the reliability of the things that you're looking at. With qualitative data, you're not looking at the statistical end of it. You're just looking at sort of the people end of it. What are people doing with that information that you're giving them? You go through an open coding process, and that usually looks like finding information that people have written about or said in an interview, and you want to pull out the little pieces that seem to stick together or make sense in some sort of order until you hit this point called saturation where you have enough information. Now here we look at a couple of little forum posts from World of Warcraft, and you can see that there are some trends here, and they're sort of marked by these white arrows. After you go through and find enough trends, you can start to see commonalities between the things these people are talking about, and eventually you can create codes for them. So you can actually go through and do exactly what I was describing earlier, where you look at what are people actually doing and how can we capitalize on that. Now here, with the World of Warcraft forum example, we can say that there are certain categories that come out as a result of these specific types of posts. So for instance, establishing a problem, stating a fact, making an act of hostility, which would be trolling, or an act of affirmation where you're saying, good job. And in addition to that, you can look at tone and the kinds of things people say, which could be negative and non-constructive, like you suck, and we're better than you noobs, or positive and constructive, which it sounds like you guys are on the right track, I'd recommend doing such and such, giving an actual piece of feedback, and then everything in between. Now with this particular bit of research, this is what came out of it, was sort of a flowchart that shows how are people interacting in World of Warcraft's forums and what could we do or potentially start doing to be able to motivate people to have more positive interactions than negative interactions. Because we know that if you have negative non-constructive posts like you noobs suck, it's going to derail the thread and it's just going to stop there. But if you have people who have a positive constructive tone, you're going to come up with this sort of co-developed or socially developed solution to a unique problem. So the goal ends up being, how, as a World of Warcraft developer, could I get people to do this more often? So first you'd establish a particular trend, and then you'd go back and look at, okay, now what can we do to experiment with it to see what will get people to behave in a way we want them to behave? Now, the way we've applied this, my colleagues and I, one way is to actually change the way we look at assessment, the way we test people. Final exams are horrible. I think we can all generally agree with that. And those represent one kind of assessment. It's called a summative assessment or an end unit assessment. Sort of the, the very final piece of a course, that's when we're going to find out if you learned everything you needed to know.
we actually wanted to take an alternative approach to that. And rather than looking at what do you know at that specific moment, how are you actually growing over time? How is your knowledge growing? How is it expanding? How are you making connections like you didn't before? And it takes on what we call continuous embedded formative assessment, which is an ongoing assessment rooted in the gameplay that students are having or that players are having. Now with this particular card game we developed, what happens is we give a bunch of controversies. It's very similar to apples to apples or cards against humanity, except with one important difference that you're actually debating for your card. You're not simply slipping them into the pile. You're actually having a debate to argue on behalf of your card. So in this particular example, I might roll a 10 on my 20-sided die, and my conflict or controversy is more helpful in the development of education law. We're going to go, and the three of us who are playing are going to go around, and we're going to have a debate about this. One person is going to be our judge, and two people are going to be our debaters. Now, each of them would choose a card from the hand that they were dealt at the beginning of the game. One of them, in this case, chose cellular phones, and the other person chose small group work. And their goal would be to debate which is more helpful in the development of educational law. Now, just like a debate in a debate club or in a class, what you'd do is have one person make their initial argument, have this person make their rebuttal to that, and then you'd go through and do the same thing. You'd get a second opportunity to do that, and then the other person would get a second opportunity to do that. And finally, the judge, the independent third party, makes a decision about whose argument was better. But for us, we were actually targeting educational goals. And so we were having students debate things that were relevant to the programs of study they were in. Now, you can imagine that as you play this along the course of a year, it's going to be pretty apparent whether or not people are picking up the material as they're going, because their debating is going to get better. If I know a lot more about small group work at the end of the year than I do at the beginning of the year, it's going to be indicated by my gameplay. And the more often I play this, the more data I have as an instructor to look at, are my students learning what I want them to learn? If I own a business, it's the same thing. Are my employees learning the things I want them to learn? Now, what we actually did with this, we've done this experiment to some extent. We've done it a couple of times now, mostly with faculty and grad students. But we're starting to do it with actual students. We've actually started looking for these codes, just like I showed with the qualitative data before. And what we found is that there's some pretty decent consistency in the way people play. Some of these things include the way that judgment is done, the way that people recast their argument or say the argument over again in opposition to another one, the way that players interject while the others are talking, and that could be productive or non-productive, and whether or not people support what they say with theory or not. And ultimately, this is what you get out of that with qualitative data. You get these little boxes, and they show percentage-wise how often are people using that kind of argument, which sort of translates to us to what extent are they using the things we want them to use as opposed to the ones we don't. So if you saw a box that was labeled as fluff that had nothing to do, they were talking about things that were completely unrelated to the actual debate, you'd want that box to get smaller over time, and you'd want the one about actual substantiated content to get bigger. So if we were doing this over the course of the year, we as instructors end up with this really awesome graphic that shows our, our, whether or not our students are learning what we want them to learn. So we've created this awesome formative assessment tool that's not as complex for a student as, well, go study this, cram as hard as you can for eight hours, take the test, and then either fail or pass, uh, forget everything you learned. This is actually saying we want to see is there longevity to what you're learning and what is that longevity. The other piece of this is creating role-playing games. And that's what I described earlier with what my colleagues and I have done. The one that's up here right now is actually for the educational psychology version of it. But there's one for Latin, and there's one for biology. And they're working on one for Greek and for advanced AP Latin. And these aren't just short little things. They're actually extended role-playing games. Now, how many of you are familiar with Dungeons and Dragons? OK, I would hope so. I mean, it is a comic book anime convention. This is a good place to find people who like D&D. If you've ever played D&D, you'd be familiar with the idea that you start with a character, it levels up over time, and you often play for many sessions over an extended period of time. That's exactly what goes on here. Every other day or so, these students that are participating in these role-playing games we've created are interacting in these small groups, and each group controls a character not entirely dissimilar from the way the Twitch TV Pokemon thing is going on right now. Now, the major difference is that this is not a video game. It's a text-based role-playing game like D&D. So you actually have the opportunity to discuss what you want your character to do. And that's where we look for the learning. 
do you go out and use the resources we've afforded you to be able to make decisions for your character in this story we've created? The thing that sets this apart from just being D&D is this idea that we have learning objectives that we start with. We have goals for people that we want them to fulfill. This is what I was talking about earlier. How do we get people to learn the things we want them to learn and not just the things they feel like learning? How do we get them to participate in GTA's main story instead of just going off and killing everybody with a jet? Those are things that we as teachers need to care about. So we take and create this story environment based on our learning objectives and essentially target these high-level skills we want people to have. So not just memorizing stuff, not just memorizing the periodic table, but being able to use the periodic table for some constructive purpose. And so rather than having school be a continuous session of let me memorize everything and then regurgitate it for the test, we're actually saying we don't care if you memorize all this stuff. We think that the Internet exists for a reason, that you should be able to use research, not just look it up and remember it. Our goal is to get people evaluating and critically thinking and analyzing about what they're actually reading or studying. Now this is what that looks like in practice. You have a course objective, you have a unit objective, you have individual objectives, just like in a game. A game has a major storyline or a major plot line, it has subplots, and then it has missions within each of those subplots. So if I'm going to talk about Skyrim, for example, I might say Skyrim's main goal is to tell you about the Dragonborn, the history of being Dovahkiin and what that means. And then the subplots might include my journey from the beginning of the game to Whiterun, and then meeting the Jarl and doing all those things. And then within those subplots, I'm going and doing individual missions like helping a woman catch the person who killed her chickens. Those are things that build up to this big overarching story the same way we do this with coursework. The major difference is that we look at it in terms of lessons and units as opposed to quests and subplots and overarching story arcs. So when we actually go to put this into practice, it ends up looking like a D&D campaign with the major exception being that our learning objectives and game objectives are matched at a one-to-one -one ratio. So the things we're having you learn are exactly the same things as you need to do in order to be successful at the game. Put another way, it might be helpful to think of it as if I'm asking you to go and learn about cancer research for my biology class, my prompt that I'm going to give you at the beginning of this story or within this thread of the story is going to be cure cancer because I want you to do that. Yeah. Now, that's a very complicated task, right? But if I'm framing it in the scheme of this epic story in which the villain is running away and he throws this vial on the ground and a giant tumor monster comes out and now you and your group have to face this monster and defeat it, your goal is to kill cancer. The same thing we want you to be able to do in the real world, which is a lot more appealing than what I used to have to tell my biology students, you have to learn it because it's on the test, the capped or otherwise. Exactly how we sound. <laughs> it is how I sound when I teach high school. I also slept under a desk like a vampire and only came out for school, you know, <laughs> the usual. So I would give them this prompt in the scheme of an epic story. And that goal that I had set for them, that they had been set on for this quest, was the same as the goal I wanted them to achieve in real life, to create this richly authentic experience. And it's not just gamification, because I'm not just giving them badges. It's not saying, if you go and read the book, I'll give you the award that says you read the book, which isn't really doing anything unless they value that award, which many kids don't. The goal is to give them a reason to care about this, even if it's only to progress the story and hopefully help them see the relevance of that story to the real world, to detect the similarities and differences between those things. Once they get their prompt to cure cancer, the next thing they do is go and do research, and that's usually online, and we use Wikipedia. Many people don't like Wikipedia. We actually find it to be incredibly helpful as a starting point for anything. And so we direct kids to Wikipedia and ask them to go research. What are you going to do? If your goal is to cure cancer, how are you going to do it? If you don't stop this thing, it's going to eat you, so you better figure it out. The students then come back to one another and say, well, what did you find? Well, I think it'd be a really cool idea if we went and stabbed the tumor and cut off its blood flow, because if we did that, it's going to fall down and we can kill it easier. And somebody else might say, well, I read this thing that said that if you use radiation or chemotherapy, you can actually shrink it first, and maybe that would make it easier to kill it. And then we could worry about stabbing it, because otherwise it'd be too big. And you start to see this overlap between what kids are doing and what you want them to know about this stuff. And it's not just for cancer, but for ancient Rome. I want them to know culture. How do you eat like a Roman? How do you talk like a Roman? 
for any language, that's a really complicated thing to do. And in my old French classes, all we used to do is get a book, and on one page was the English, and on the other page was French, and then you just had to like cross-translate between the pages. This is actually encouraging them to use that information productively. So the first mission in Operation Lapis, which is the Latin program, requires students to tell their name to someone. And then as they're reading the paragraph, it describes this old man heckling a little boy in a tree. And it says, the malice is yelling at the young boy. Malice is M-A-L-U-S. It's the word for what do you think that means, based on the context of the sentence. The malice is yelling at the young boy. Antagonist. It could be antagonist. Enemy. Enemy. Curmudgeon. Curmudgeon, <laughs> uh, depending on how sophisticated your freshman high school vocabulary is. Bad man, right? Malice means bad man. The bad man is yelling at the boy in the tree. And the bad man now wants to know what your name is. He demands to know. So your prompt is to tell him your name. And we tell the students, you don't have to tell the truth. But just remember that if you tell the bad man that you're Julius Caesar, he's going to know you're lying the same way that if I walked in the room and said I was Barack Obama, you'd know that I was lying. It's just one of those things that everyone in Rome knew who Caesar was, so you better make a convincing name. And that's how we get them to begin Latin. It's the same thing that you do in your first day of any language course, is say your name in the language. My name is such and such. Mayamo Stephen. So our goals are to get the students communicating about that and to look up the information about what do I need to know to be able to say my name so this guy isn't going to think I'm a jerk or think that I'm lying to him and then maybe he'll start yelling at me or maybe he'll pick me up and throw me in a well. I don't know what's going to happen. And then we ask them to reflect on that experience. And that's a piece we usually do face to face. It depends on the program. But ideally, we have them reflect on it and say, why did you make that decision? Was that a good idea? Wasn't it a good idea? And why or why not? And that gets back to this whole idea of building philosophizing games, building cave breaking games. Not just using the role playing for the sake of getting people to understand from the perspective of doing it, but also getting them to understand why it matters. And how do their decisions actually affect the outcomes? And then you start over again with the next mission. And so you can see how these little submissions build up to subplots that build up to the bigger story. Now there's, like I said, a specific way we do this where you start with these primary objectives and then you build up to what do you want your game to be about and then eventually how are you going to assess these things and then eventually you end up writing the story. Now many people, especially game designers, will start with here's the story we want to tell and now we're going to go work on the mechanics. We actually do it the other way around where you start with your mechanics and then build up to the story that you're going to do because we want to make sure that those game and learning objectives are always the same. There's a couple of things we have to be careful of, though, and we call this the epic fail trap, where we don't want to epic fail. And in gaming environments that are corporate or educational, there's a lot of opportunities to sort of screw this up because many times people will implement it in a way that doesn't really make sense. So the first thing that happens is people often assimilate these ideas into what already exists. So we take a very direct instruction approach where I just talk at you, and then... I add this new cool thing in where I'm role playing, but then sort of pull it back into me telling you how to role play, which defeats the purpose of doing it. You lose the authentic authenticity of the environment. So we suggest people make a fixins bar, this idea that there's certain things that people can add or remove from the game that makes it more workable for them as individuals, but without breaking it so that it's still direct instruction. We want anchored instruction. We want social instruction, people to work together to problem solve, not just the teacher to tell them what to do. The second one is sort of loss of fidelity. We want to make sure people kind of buy into these things. And that's a really important question, figuring out why do kids buy, or why do people, I guess, buy into specific kinds of games or not. And interestingly, the research about games has shown that graphics really don't matter very much. It doesn't matter if your game looks awesome or if it looks terrible. And I think Minecraft is a good example of that. Minecraft actually went back and took a retro look intentionally. And it didn't matter to people because the mechanics were good. It was a really strong, well-developed game. And that sandbox mattered to people. So if you look at the mechanics of the game first and don't worry about sort of that other stuff, you can probably get buy-in more easily. And what we really need to isolate is what elements matter most. We have actually reason to believe that story matters a lot more than people used to think or typically think. And it's not necessarily the story in the game, but the story you can tell about the game. And I can tell people about that really hard Angry Birds level that I couldn't beat, and I could ask someone for help. And that's a good story to tell someone. 
So looking for those kinds of elements is really important. And then finally, not being able to nurture that environment. If you don't create a place for people to go, if you don't create a metagame, if you don't have that website or that YouTube channel or whatever else, it's going to fall apart. And so these are things that we believe that game developers and academics, researchers, could get from one another. Right now, both of those areas of expertise are totally not talking to one another. They talk over one another. Instead of sort of finding ways to partner with each other, we think that these problems could be easily solved if the two would contribute to one another's work. That as a corporation, if I'm going to work on creating a new video game, I might give access to the log file data to an academic who can make sense of that data in a way that's going to help me improve my game experience. And then they can take that information and use it in the educational environment. So with that, I just kind of want to let people mull it over, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So if there's anything driving question you might have, not necessarily just about what I talked about, but anything to do with games or about research with games or anything like that. Well, what about game? I've been looking at like fitness trackers recently, and mm. a lot of the software in them is about uh, you know you get points for doing something all day, or there's one yep. of them where you don't necessarily get points, but well, you get points, but the more points you get, you get to buy a new habit, and it's a new goal to work for. Yeah. Is there any you know, view of that kind of stuff? What kind of yeah, yeah, actually, uh, we're working on a paper, an editorial paper right now that actually talks specifically about Fitbit, yeah. because Fitbit is one of those tools, and it's a social networking tool. So if you've never seen Fitbit, it's this little tool you keep on your belt, and it basically counts the number of steps you take and how many stairs you go up and down. And you can use it for social networking purposes to compare and contrast with friends or family that also use it. And often they encourage people to compete with one another to see who can get the most steps in a day. So it's actually pretty similar to the gyroscope mechanism that's in the 3DS. So those kinds of things are where this gamification stuff works really well. Another good example of it is there's an app for the iPhone, and maybe for Android as well. When you go for a run, it basically tracks it as if you are being chased by a horde of zombies. <laughs> and as you do that, it unlocks new stuff, and you can unlock new paths and all kinds of different things. And those kinds of behavioral reinforcers are really good. But it's really important to note that they only work for people who are motivated to do them in the first place. So if you don't have any motivation or goal to go running, it doesn't matter how good the game is, you're probably not going to do it. Isn't that just as true as somebody being motivated to down the next Warcraft? Yep. Uh, boss? It's the same exact thing, yeah. Everything that we do is governed by behaviorism in that way, that if you're not being reinforced in a way that you find acceptable, you're just not going to do that thing or feel motivated. Yeah. From a behavioral psychological standpoint, what do you think you could add to something like Fitbit to make, to sort of... Um, App, put that, um, you know, the worm on the hook, if you will. That's a really good question. One of those things is to further increase the social networking capabilities. Look at ways you can actually integrate those things into people's lives elsewhere. So, a good example of that there was a group at Stanford, I believe, that was trying to do something similar with electricity savings. And so they actually encouraged people to track their electricity usage. And the less electricity they used, or the more they reduced it, the more points they got in this online social networking game that they created. Mm -hmm. And those points could be used to do more stuff in the game. So if you imagine like Candy Crush, for example, it was basically the equivalent of something like that. You would take and earn your points by reducing your electricity usage, and then those points would allow you to continue playing Candy Crush. Um, if there was a way to figure out what kinds of things would make that compelling to a broader audience, that would probably fix the problem. But Again, it's a matter of testing and seeing what kinds of things work and what don't. We just don't really know. One consideration that I would recommend is creating something like the Zombies Run app and using it to create a story. So kind of a tell your own or choose your own adventure based on the amount of exercise you do. The more exercise you do, you can unlock new chapters of your story and put it together. Would that be similar like the, um, the Pokemon... Yeah, it'd be very similar to the Poke Walker. And, well, except in my world, it would be building something different, but it would be the same right. idea. But it's the same principle. Right. Like if, if playing Pokemon and leveling up your Pokemon was the same as, you know, accomplishing something mm -hmm. that required running, like losing weight and 
attaching it to something else in your life that was e that was more meaningful at that point. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people like you want to lose weight. You also want to play Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Playing Pokemon is easier than losing weight. So how do you sort of tip the scales to where losing the weight becomes perceived ease, or the sort of the, the worth becomes equal to the the, the or the means justify the ends, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of thing where, because um, I think that was the whole goal with like the Poker Walker was, well, kids play video games and sometimes they get them to sit on their butts all day. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and that's not good necessarily. Mm -hmm. But we want them to play video games because we're a video game company. So what we do is let's give them a way to not sit on their butts that also helps them play video games. And that's, like street pass. exactly, yeah. like Street Pass. And one of the things that we talk about, especially in situated cognition is this idea of the intentional spring and that your goal is to be able to shift intentions from one place to another. The intentional spring is sort of a theoretical experiment where you can imagine there's a wall between two people, a teacher or an instructor and a student, and the student's blindfolded, they can't see anything, and there's a notch in this wooden wall that extends a pretty long distance. And in the middle of that is a rod, a metal rod attached to a spring. And over time, you want to be able to get the student who's blindfolded to be able to move it to the same spot over and over and over again. So the goal really becomes, how can I get my student to be able to move that enough times to be able to adjust it and get a feel for where the thing should be? That's what the Poke Walker was attempting to do to some extent, was to be use that Poke Walker as an intermediary between Pokemon and exercising so that you develop an intention to exercise just as a function of having experienced, earning experience points in Pokemon by getting people to exercise. So you're pairing the two things. Right, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. it's like behavioral pairing. You're creating the, the lever press. Right. And so those things can be effective. They cannot be effective. It depends on the reinforcer and whether or not it's strong enough. Because if it's not something that's compelling enough in and of itself, for instance, with the Pokewalker, if the new version of Pokemon comes out and the right. Pokewalker doesn't work with it, suddenly I've lost all my motivation to keep using the Poke Walker. So right. it has to be something that has longevity, but... The reason I asked specifically was because things like Latin or learning, for example, mm -hmm. it, it, it lends itself very well to narrative. Mm -hmm. But then I was thinking about um, something like, like physical activity, which is a little, like, taught, like, typing on a forum doesn't help you get better or more motivated to be physically active. Right. So it, how would you sort of translate those things out and I don't anticipate you may not have the answer to this but that is something I would assume you know one of the things we've talked about and we have another paper about this actually is this idea that narrative structure is really good for a lot of different things like humanities based stuff it's not very good for certain things like if you want to train a brain surgeon to identify specific structures in the brain when they go to operate because you don't have the visualization of that that you need to be able to enact that behavior. And there are simulations you can do that are computer-based where you have a brain and you have your tools and you kind of mimic the behavior. What we suggest doing is individual content areas going and exploring what things work best for them and then using the same process of taking game mechanics that are effective for that specific purpose and repurposing them for that thing. So. Narrative is really helpful with Latin. It's not very helpful for pharmacy, let's say. So would you create like an end goal, and again using the physical, physical activity example, mm -hmm. like the end goal is do a certain amount of physical activity, burn X number of calories, like, or whatever your metric is, mm -hmm. and you would expose them to two dozen different exercises and find whichever one sort of, in it sort of allow, allow them to find the path of least resistance by, get, by affording them exposure? like. I think that would work. Example. Yeah, I think from a behavioral perspective that would work. I mean, your goal, it would be an empirical question to be able to say, of these 12 exercises, which one generates the most motivation and maybe or engagement. Yeah, right. Like, but that's one of the reasons why we argue for this situated thing, is we want to know about particular people at particular times in particular ways. And people will approach those things completely differently for different reasons, and we want to know why. And now there's sort of just to bridge the two. Um, you have the physical activity thing, which is like way out in left field, mm -hmm. and you have the learning element, which is in the narrative. What about something like mathematics? That doesn't, is it really, there's like, how, can you, you tell a story? I guess you could tell a story and you just have word problems, or how would you? There's a series called The Adventure.